But before I begin, I got to keep up Nate's jokes. <laughs> so what do you get from a pampered cow? Oh my God. Yep, it's going to be cows. <laughs> Spoiled milk. Um, how do you count cows? With a calculator. <laughs> and the last one. Um, sorry, I have a hard time reading my own handwriting sometimes. <laughs> what do you talk about when you're milking a cow? Anybody? Utterly nothing. <laughs> there you go. You'll probably never hear cow jokes from Nate. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, let me put this up here. So Colossians. This is an interesting book. Um, what I mean by interesting is it's it really hits you. Um, you know, when you actually dig into even the first the first book or the first chapter, uh, chapter one, it is plain and simply. I mean, without rebuttal, it is the truth. Um, you know, as I'm sitting there listening to different uh, commentaries in my car, driving around this week, it's amazing how well and how hard it hits you and how it brings you back to just the simple basics. Anything that you may have been thinking through the week or having struggles with, this flat out tells you this is how you should be acting. This is how things are. Um, it brings it right back to you. Now, the four books... Uh, the four, I should say, the four chapters in this are. Look at my notes here, real quick. So the four chapters are basically broke up into a couple of different ways. The first chapter is simply the tr the truth about Jesus Christ. Chapter two is the truth about cults, as far as heresy, um, talking about the false teachings, things like that. And then chapter three and four is the two is the truth about the Christian. And so this just not only lays out how we're supposed to act, different ways of thinking, things like that, but also simply why. Why, why is it that that's there? What's the truth, the deity? Okay. So today all we're going to do is break down and, and read, chapter, or read the first chapter. Um, let me pull it out here real quick. This is my Bible that I carry with me everywhere. I don't know about you guys. So I'll go off and start reading Colossians 1. It says, The letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and from our brother Timothy. We are writing to God's holy people in the city of Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. May God our Father give you grace and peace. And then Paul's thanksgiving and prayer says, We always pray for you, and we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of God's people, which come from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You have had this expectation ever since you first heard the, tr the, the truth of the good news. This same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives just as it changed your lives from the first day you heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. You learned about the good news from, Ep from Epaphras, our beloved co-worker. He is Christ's faithful, uh, faithful servant, and he is helping us on your behalf. He has told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We, are, uh, we ask God to give you complete knowledge of His will and give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the, way you will live, then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. We also pray that you will be strengthened with this, holy, with this glorious power so that you will have all endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to the people who live in the light, for he, has, for he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear Son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. 
Christ is, vis- Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything and was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything. In the heavenly realms and on earth, he made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on the earth, by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who are once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated, by him, or separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. I'm glad, or I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. The message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people, for God wanted them to know the riches and the glories of Christ are for the Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance in sharing His glory. So, te- so we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God, perfect in their relationship to Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. So that was the first chapter of Colossians there. And it's basically broken down into three different uh, sections. So the first, I should, should say up until uh, the first section, I should say four really, uh, verse one all the way down to probably 14 on there is kind of the address. It's talking about, it's, it's saying who's writing the letter, who he's writing it to, things like that. Um, and then you have 15 to 19, and it talks about the deity of God, the deity of Jesus, of Christ Jesus the divine nature. Then we've got 20 to 22, specifically talks about the death of Christ. And then 23 to 29 is the demand of Christ. So right here in this first chapter, we're laying out the specifics of God, Christ Jesus, and the Holy Spirit and the deity. And we're putting it all together. And he's even given us instructions on how to live. Um, that was probably the, one of the most powerful things when I was going through this this week is we have this entire book and it's amazing how just in this one chapter it lays it out so clearly without any big words that I can't pronounce and names that I can't pronounce. But it just, it real simply just breaks it down to where it flat out tells you what, you're, what you need to be doing. A um, couple of things about Colossae. Let me go into my fact sheet here. So this book was written by Paul, obviously. Uh, they estimate it was A.D. 60 to 61 in Rome while he was still, in the ho- while he was still in uh, house arrest. The interesting thing is, is uh, this is another thing that hit me with this passage, is Paul never, they, they believe that Paul never actually went to Colossae. Um, he never actually visited them, uh, the church of Colossae there. And what's more interesting than anything is God used not necessarily a preacher per se, um, somebody that was ordained or a preacher to be able to share the word, but God used just somebody, Paul. God used Paul to share the gospel. And with that, some of the people that heard the word from Paul, or from Paul um, I can't even pronounce, this is the one name I have a hard time pronouncing, Epaphras, I think is how it's pronounced. Um, Epaphras heard the gospel from Paul. And he went out and actually started and began or began some of the churches in, or the church in Colossae. And that's where you get the Colossians from. 
Um, and so what's happening here is Paul has heard things, a lot of good things about the church in Colossae, but also some different issues with, her- with heresy and some other false teachings that are happening. So that's one of the reasons why Paul is addressing this church and basically just flat out, this is the truth. He's not saying you're off track, you're doing this or condemning them. He's just coming back simply with the straight truth that can't be rebutted. That's all it is. Um, <clears throat> so the first note I have here we just talked about, it was a, Paul, it was a Pauline church with, or, uh, that was indirectly the result of Paul's ministry. As far as we know, it says here, Paul, was never, or Paul never visited Colossae, at least not the time that he wrote the epistle. He had only heard about the church from Colossians. Uh, never, nevertheless, he was a product of his ministry and beautifully illustrates a commitment to impart his vision of teaching others with the powerful message of the gospel. This is so illustrated in the following ways. As first, Paul spent three years ministering the word of, Eph- of, Ephes- of Ephesus from the lecture room and the school... This is another one I don't really spell too, where I don't pronounce very well, but uh, Tyrannus. I, when I read stuff like that, I think of it really fast, and I think of Tyrannosaurus. And that's, what I, that's how I read through it fast enough. Um, it was during the first time all of Asia heard the, wor- heard the word of the, of the Lord. Ephesus had three great attractions that brought people to the city and parts of Asia. It was a seaport town and the center of commerce and the temple of Diana, and also known as an idol worship. So here we have Colossae that was basically kind of in between several different towns. Colossae was a fairly large city, and then by the time that Paul wrote this letter, it's already dropping down. There, um, I wasn't able to find any actual estimates of the population of the town, but, they did, but everything I've read was that it was dropping, the population was dropping pretty steadily as they were starting to go towards the different towns, kind of more metropolis, um, if you would think of it that way. Um, at the same time, though, the church was facing serious doctrinal and, pr- and practical problems. It says here, though the apostle never gives a formal explanation of the heresy facing the Colossians, the chief focus and features of the epistle, along with Paul's argument, show that there are serious threats of false teaching facing Colossians. This teaching sought to undermine the person and work of Christ and the sufficiency of the salvation, uh, or of the salvation believers in Him. So, yeah, there was, I wouldn't say gossip, but there was talk about the church. There was talk about where they were, how they, everything that they were believing. And as word got back to Paul, he was learning that, hey, there's some false teachings that are happening. We're going to go ahead and straighten this out. That's one of the reasons why he wrote this letter. So if we go, start going back to the actual scripture here. It says here on verse 3, it says, We always pray for you and we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the things that's interesting, it says we always pray for you. When do, in all reality, especially driving around, my mind's thinking about a thousand different things. A lot of times when I find that I'm intently praying on something, it's what I like, is what I've heard referred to in the past, and I tend to call it more of a flare prayer. What are those? I'm calling on you, Jake. Send them out. Just send them out. In other words, something's happening. Something's in crisis. Something's wrong. And at that moment, we're recognizing that we cannot do it alone, that we need God's help. So we're sending out this flare prayer. And, you know, if the day's going good and we're having a good time, we, had it, we didn't crash going to Douglas or we didn't do this or we didn't do that. We're not sending out these prayers all day long saying, God, thanks for giving me a safe drive there. Thanks for not... You know, give me a flat tire or having a, tire, having, a, having a blowout down the road. Thanks for not doing this or thanks for, thanks for this or thanks for that. A lot of times I am just as guilty for not thanking the Lord. Hey, Lord, that last call we had, thank you for, for the way it turned out because I get to go home at night or whatever it may be. But a lot of times I find myself praying, Lord, I'm in a pickle and I don't know how to fix this one. And... Just get me through this. Just get me through this one last thing, Lord. And that's what we find what we're doing all the time. But here in this letter, it says, We always pray for you and we give thanks to God. So, does that mean that he was, give, that he was praying for him only because he heard of the heresy? 
No, he's, he's praying for them because they're hearing of all the good things that's happening in Colossae as well. Um, it says here, For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and all the love for God's people. So he's flat out saying, we are continually praying for you guys, not because of how bad things are going, but because of how good things are going. We're talking about, we're praising the good works that are, that's happening out, the, out of that church. Um, it says, you have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. This same good news that, you, that came to you is going all over the world. It is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. Now, it doesn't flat out say what changed in their lives. Everybody has different issues. Everybody has different things going on. Everybody has different struggles. And that's where, uh, when I was reading through this, the way it spoke to me was thinking, you know, what struggles my wife has are different struggles than I have many times. And, but still, the same simple fact is, after hearing the word of the Lord and hearing that about salvation, it's amazing how it can change your life. Um, again, on verse 9, it starts out by saying, we have, or, So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God, or we ask God to give you the complete knowledge of His will and give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Let me read that again here. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of His will and give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. How many of you guys wish you had that every single day to have the exact will of God, knowing exactly what you're supposed to be doing, exactly what He wants you to be doing, and having that kind of knowledge to know what's happening. It's not, it would be nice to have, and we can talk to them through prayer, as well as judging some of the different fruits that, that are happening in our lives, some, some of the different trials and issues that we're having. Um, then, the way, or then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. I mean, who doesn't want that? All right. Um, again, he is saying again in verse 11 about prayer. It says, we also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power and you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. So again, it's talking about prayer. Prayer again. We're, pr we're still praying. Even though we're praying for the trials in our life, but also praying for all the good things that have been happening. Um, and then going into verse 15, like I talked about, the sec the, basically like that first real portion after he gets through the address of the letter. So it started at verse 15. This is talking about Christ. And it says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. This is the deity. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. So is there, I mean, we all know it, but is there really, just, just with that, is there anything that has power over God? No. If he created everything, there's nothing that has power over him. Um, for through him, God created everything. In the heavenly realms and on earth, he made the things we can see and the things we can't see. Such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and it goes down and lays out a whole bunch of different um, uh, visuals for you to be able to picture. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. One of the things I have a hard time is, you know, looking at some of that and thinking about it, I try to put it into perspective into my mind, and I start thinking about what are all of those things? But yet at the same time, it says it, we can't even see them. If we can't even see them, that's where I have a hard time a lot of times with believing. If, I, if somebody says, yeah, this is what happened on a call or a, or, a, or a scene or crime scene or whatever it is, and this is what happened. If, the pieces aren't, if I'm not able to see the pieces put together, I have a hard time believing that, even though it may be the truth. But yet God's sitting here saying that he... 
He created everything, everything we can see and the unseen. He existed before anything else. He holds all creation together. Christ is the head of the church, which is the body. So he's the head of the church, but also the body of the church. So we're putting everything kind of together in one, in one big package. Um, he is the beginning, or he is beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is the first in everything. Now, the only thing I, I didn't do is I didn't go through there and actually count up how many times just this scripture in these first few ver- in these first uh, these few verses are talking about how God is the beginning, God is the first, God is everything, God is. I mean, I can't think of any other ways to explain the highest. The, the highest of the heights to the point where you can't even measure anymore. Um, just about every way possible, he's just, there, it's being described in here. So he is the first in everything. For God is, or God is in his fullness, was, or God, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. So again, right here on verse 19, it flat out says, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. What is this referring to? I'm going to keep calling on you, Jake. <laughs> it says, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. So are they two different people then? No, they're the same. Just like when he was talking about Christ is the head of the church and also the body. It's the same thing. God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, all the same thing. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were far away from God. You were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to, or to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. It's talking about the resurrection. So here we are, we've already talked about the actual deity of Christ, how the supreme person or the supreme being i guess you can say the the ultimate the beginning the first everything about of everything about god then we start going into the actual sacrifice that was made which is christ jesus it says as a result he's brought you into his own presence you're holy and blameless as you stand before him with a, without a single fault but you must continue to believe his truth and stand and or stand firmly in it so here he's talking about the, act, or the idea that God gave himself for our sins. We are standing there blameless, sinless in front of him. All we have to do is ask for it. But the idea that, uh, that, that the, this is where I believe some of the, um, and this is just purely my speculation from different things that I've read, there is no, like I said at the beginning, there is no specific that says this is what the heresy was that Paul was writing to, to argue against. There is no specific language in there that talks about what those different teachings, false teachings were. But I think the fact that he lays it out there so clear, I think part of it was the idea that once saved, always saved. Because it specific, it, he firmly puts in here, but you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. If we, can, if we become saved, we know the truth. But yet if we choose to back away from the Lord and fall away from the Lord and consciously choose to, to, to follow the false teachings, I don't want to be there that day at the gates waiting and hear the bad news. I want to know for a fact that when my time is there, I'm going to see Jesus, and I'm going to be at those gates. And with that idea in mind, we need to be constantly thinking and constantly remembering of what Christ did for us on the cross. Um, in, oh, and it goes in and says, uh, so then here's a, towards the end, um, on verse 24, talks about the commandments. So we've discussed the deity, we've discussed the resurrection of Christ, 
and the idea that God has actually saved us, or God has saved us from all of our sins. So says, I'm glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. You know, back then they didn't have the Eighth Amendment. They didn't have the Bill of Rights and the amendments that say you can't have cruel and unusual punishment. So I can only imagine some of the punishment that was, that was uh, laid out on people. Um, the only, again, until I see it, I have a hard time. Have you guys have seen the movie Passion of the Christ? It came out, what was it, like 10 years ago or something? A long time ago. So when I think of the actual, when I think of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and what he had to go through even before being put on the cross, I go back to that visual of watching that movie. Now, our movies, we all know movies aren't completely real, okay? Very rarely, even documentaries are not real. Even though they want to take us away and kind of, in a way, bring our mind somewhere else, by reading the scriptures and watching the actual uh, persecution of Christ at that time, it really makes me think about the whole idea when you think of the Eighth Amendment, which is cruel and unusual punishment in our normal in our in our society today, that type of that type of uh, discipline or cruelty would never even be thought of. But yet back then it was the way to do it. That was just the way. Um, so when when Paul's sitting here talking about having to feeling the pain for the church and and for Christ, I can only imagine what that actually was. Um, you know, we think of. In there, it says that Paul was under house arrest. Uh, when they talked about basically in jail, he was actually more of a house arrest. What that entailed, I could only imagine back then. Um, was it a true house arrest? Did you get your head cut off as soon as you left the house? I don't know the specifics of it. Um, but it says here for Paul, it says, God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. The message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know the riches and the glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. So even, of, even for the lowest of the lowest, there's still it's still for everybody. Not just for, the, not just for the kings or for the princes. The message is for everybody. Um, this gives you assurance of sharing His glory. So as it goes down, it's still talking about, so we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God. So what's he talking about here? Anybody? No? What's that? Share the gospel. Take a look at Paul. Paul is somebody that just by sharing the word, sharing the gospel... He was able to share the gospel, and God was able to use somebody that heard the word that went off and continued to share the gospel and started the Church of Colossae. Who knows who that person may be that we talk to? Who knows? Maybe it's the guy walking down the road. Maybe it's the guy that somebody goes off and buys a meal for on the side of the road because they've got a sign. Maybe it's that person that you share the word with and they are so profoundly hit upside the head with it that they have a complete turn of, of, of their life and they are on fire for Jesus. And imagine what that one person could do being able to go out and talk to all, all the different people. Maybe it's, maybe it's because they have a background with a specific gang or maybe it's because they have a background with a specific group of people. If that one person hears the word and turns towards the Lord and truly believes in the Lord, imagine how many people would know about Christ. So this is that commandment that Paul has basically given out here. He's talked to the church. He's laid out what the deity is. He's laid out what the rule or basically what the, the truth is about Christ. Then he lays out direction where we should go with this, what we should be doing. And basically, he's not, he's, he doesn't flat out say, cool, you're good, you've heard the gospel, you've, you've, you've turned to the Lord, you're good. Just keep going, and you're good to go. No, he's flat out saying, 
spread the word, spread the good news, share the word with other people. Essentially, somebody had to share it with you in order for you to hear it. Share the word with other people too. Um, and so that kind of brings us down to the end of the first chapter there. The chapter 2, 3, and 4, obviously we're going to be talking about different things. I won't be doing those because Nate will be back, which will be good. Um, I don't do really long sermons when I do them, so we're fairly short. But um, otherwise, I think we're ready for more worship. <laughs> yeah. Lord Jesus, I just want to thank you for this time. Uh, even though, Lord, it seems like the entire Bible almost comes down into one chapter, Lord. And the chapter is simply about you, Lord Jesus. It is about you and what you've done for us, Lord Jesus. You've created the heavens. You've created the earth. You are the first, the alpha and the omega, Lord Jesus. You're the beginning and the end. And Lord, I just, I thank you for that. I thank you for, for giving us everything we have. And Lord, I just pray that we just continue to pray. We pray all the time, not just in flare prayers in times of need, Lord Jesus, but also prayer and rejoicing and sharing the good news and bringing, bringing others to know you, Lord Jesus. Because who knows, there's that, there's that one person out there, Lord, that you want me to touch with the Lord, with, with the, the Spirit, Lord Jesus, and the, and the gospel of the, of the Lord. And I don't know exactly who that person is, Lord Jesus, but you know. And eventually, Lord Jesus, if, if you just continue to give me the strength to talk to more people, Lord Jesus, then maybe I'll be able to, I'll be able to, to, to talk to that one person, Lord. And to share the gospel with you, or with them, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this time, and, and I just pray you just continue to, to bless us, Lord Jesus, and, and Lord, help us share the, the gospel and the word of the, of the truth, Lord. Amen.